Welcome to the at-home edition of World of Fortnite. I'm your host, Sarah Pookieface Lynn, and joined with me, as always, is Shia Wager. All the way from home, we have a great show for you guys today. You're looking at the top five unique Save the World LTMs in the rotation. Point of interest looks at the evolution of Tilted Towers, and of course, we have all your favorite memes in the low ground. Now, G.I. Joe's Snake Eyes has arrived in Fortnite. In addition to the skin, Hasbro is also going to release an action figure. Shio, how much is this thing going to be worth as a collector's item one day? Uh, anywhere between zero to maybe even one million dollars. Who knows what happens with the world? I've seen games where different things become currency, so that could be a possibility too. Uh, but either way, if it's worth less or more, as long as you're having fun with the action figures and the skins in game, that's what matters the most. You're absolutely right. But up next, the rotation lists five Save the World limited time modes you'll definitely want to check out. <gasps> Fortnite Save the World has a pretty basic gameplay loop for its normal missions. Most of these involve defending an objective for around 10 minutes or going around saving survivors or defeating encampments. Today we'll be taking you through 5 of the Save the World's best game modes. At number 5, we have Survive the Storm. Survive the Storm was our first introduction to the desert biome. In fact, even Battle Royale reused assets from this biome back in Chapter 1, Season 5. Survive the Storm was all about protecting multiple stationary targets in a desert, as multiple hordes of husks tried to damage them from various directions. The number of targets went up as the game progressed, making it harder to defend when more than one was under attack at the same time. Number 4 on our list is the Hotel Hexylvania map. This zone is unlocked each year during Halloween and features an abandoned and haunted hotel with a variety of missions for you to complete. The zone is pretty unique with the giant desolated hotel allowing for some interesting scenarios for fighting husks. The rest of the gameplay is just like traditional save the world modes, but the difficulty doesn't scale over time and the missions aren't too long. At number 3 we have the dungeons. Also a Halloween game mode, the dungeons are the most unique mode in save the world. Considering how the game is all about defending stationary objects, the dungeon mode has players going in a deep underground dungeon Destiny style. The deeper you go, the stronger the enemies get. Of course, it's not as complex as Destiny's raids, but it is a game mode in which Fortnite steps away from its original style gameplay to give us a little bit more. Number two on our list is Frost Knight. Frost Knight is the classic Christmas game mode that is unlocked in December every year. Squads of four have to survive various challenges in a snow biome, and the twist is that you start with barely any resources. Frost Knight is an infinite survival mode with enemy levels increasing round after round. Your objective is to survive and keep a burner ignited by fueling it with blue glow. Hordes of enemies try to attack you and damage the burner each round, and you have to build giant elaborate forts to protect it. You also have to look for blue glow, craft traps and weapons, and look for supply drops that bring you better resources between rounds. At number one, we have the Storm King. The Storm King is the main antagonist of Save the World, and this mission is the official conclusion of the campaign. The mission involves defeating the giant king of the storm and is hands down the hardest mission in the game. You require the right team with the right heroes and some serious coordination. Most players attempting it for the first time need a number of tries to complete it. There are two variants of this mode, one in Canny Valley and one in Twine Peaks. You want to complete the one in Twine Peaks because it is the only way to obtain the mythic items and weapons in the game right now. Shio, if you had control of Save the World, what kind of LTM would you make? You know, I've liked all the additions to BR these past couple of seasons where we have the heroes and, you know, the whole entire Marvel season. Now we have those bounty hunters and Save the World. I'd like to see a crossover event, you know, heroes versus hunters. You get to play as both. You have cool locations, biomes and whatnot. But, you know, that'd be really cool. Pookie, what about you? What is your favorite Save the World LTM? My favorite Save the World LTM has to be Storm King, but they brought it over to the BR and I ended up playing it a ton with friends. Kind of brought me back, gave me that whole Destiny raid vibe. But speaking of friends, I had the chance to catch up with Tech Girl and discuss all things Fortnite. Today, I'm getting the chance to sit down with Tech Girl and discuss all things Fortnite. First off, how are you doing? 
I'm good, recovering from DreamHack Europe. We had two days of awesome Fortnite, lots of lots of games in the mix, so I took the day off to chill, but now I'm ready to jump back into some video games and back into spending my life in front of my PC as we all do during lockdown. <laughs> we all do in and out of lockdown, it seems, at least for me. Uh, but let's uh, uh, start off with something basic for our viewers. So how did you get into esports and what drew you to the scene? So it's really interesting because, I mean, I, I grew up gaming, so my entire family was giant nerds, except my mom. But my dad was always on the computer. Obviously, he let my brother and I jump on from a young age. And my brother actually got into competitive Dota in South Africa, which is where I grew up. And South Africa's esports scene it's kind of small, it's a good like 10 years behind everyone else. So most of the competitions were in basements and you were playing for mouse mats, which was very exciting for my brother. And they went to a big LAN tournament and their team had a huge upset. They took a game of one of the favorites and him and his friends decided that this was it. They were gonna be these professional Dota players because they were obviously very good at it. Our house happened to have the best internet, which means every weekend my brother and his friends used to land around our dining room table and I used to bring them tea. That was how I got into it nice. <laughs> because I used to, I, I played games, but I, I was always a little bit scared. My, my brother's quite competitive, so he wasn't exactly welcoming to, to <laughs> let me jump in. So watching them play was kind of the safe way to be involved. And from that, I got really involved. I used to go and watch my brother play. And then over the years, my brother ended up sort of going to university. He stopped competing, but his friends who I'd all seen grow up, they carried on playing. And I'll never forget here in South Africa, we had this uh, a, a telecoms company drop like six figures into esports out of the blue. And they had this huge event. And I, I remember there's a, a specific kid. His name is actually Ashton Muller. Everyone knows him as Goals in South Africa. And he had moved from Dota to CS and he was running around this big massive event they had. You know how it is with all the lights and it's like a launch event and there's lots of famous people right, and right. there's all these cameras. And I'll never forget Ash running around so excited and he came running to me and he was just like high on the energy and he looked at me and he was like, Sam, this is it. Like this, this is it. Like finally esports is going to get taken seriously. And like my, you know, my dad is going to see what I'm doing and he's, he's going to be so hyped. And at that stage I was kind of blogging. So I got to go to these events, but I also knew by then how the media worked. And I was like, they're going to be super hyped today, but tomorrow they're going to have forgotten about this. And I don't know what it was about Ash's excitement, but I didn't want him to be disappointed the next day when everyone had forgotten about esports. So I kind of was like, you know what, I've got this platform where I'm talking about tech and video games. I'm going to focus now on doing esports as well and telling these South African player stories. And that was literally how it started. And then from there, it kind of was like a tumbleweed. Next thing I was at events making my own silly blog. Someone was like, oh, we need someone to do player interviews. They handed me a microphone. And then suddenly I was shout casting and commentating <laughs> by mistake. And interestingly enough, Ash is now, he runs one of the biggest uh, MGOs in South Africa and his dad wow. uh, helps him. So it did all work out for us really well, but not something I planned. So a lot of other people plan it and they're gonna make it a career. Right, I kind of right. just, I just wanted Ash and his friends to have a good time, you know? Oh gosh, and that definitely speaks to the kind of person you are. You know, we haven't met too long ago, but you, you just give off this good vibe. And I love to hear stories like that, you know, taking something that you didn't expect and then just turning it into just a huge part of your life. That's that's amazing. Now, I have to ask, so you, you were in a Dota a little bit, you, you saw the CSGO scene. How did you get into Fortnite? What were your first impressions of the game? So I got into Fortnite a little bit by accident. So my, my first love was always CS, believe it or not, like a huge FPS fan, loved CS, and then kind of just found myself in FPS. It's what I know, so I was, I was talking about, I did CS and I did some Overwatch, and then obviously PUBG came around, and, and I started doing a lot of PUBG work, and I just fell in love with Battle Royale as a whole. So all the Battle Royale games I love, I find them far more entertaining from a viewer perspective to watch. Uh, I enjoy the, the narrative that comes about. And because of that, I think that that battle royale, that battle royale love happened. Uh, and then Fortnite in South Africa, very young community, but very, very passionate. And I got quite excited because in my country, one of the things that, that we lack is we have some socioeconomic issues, which means a lot of people struggle to have access to PCs. So they're playing a lot on right. consoles, on mobile. 
And Fortnite allowed all these kids to play. So when we had a LAN, like hundreds of kids would pitch up because now they actually had the ability to play. And that was what kind of got me interested in Fortnite. I started watching it. I really loved it from a viewer perspective because I thought it was a, a little bit different to the standard Battle Royale. And then as time went on, I obviously DreamHack approached me and said, do you want to desk host, you know, the, the DreamHack Open featuring Fortnite? And I was like, of course I do. That would be amazing. <laughs> Because I love it as an esports, I think it's uh, it's fun to watch, and that for me yeah. is really important. Because I grew up not being the best gamer in the house, not by a long shot. So for me, watching and, and understanding the player dynamics and the stories behind these players, that's what I fell in love with, and I love telling those stories. Fortnite is such a great game to allow me to do that, and there's so many people playing the game as well, which I love because anyone can play it, no matter what device they're on, what platform. So they're invested, and that was kind of where that love, if you like, for, for Fortnite came in. I'm talking like this is like a boyfriend, right? This is like this very deep, meaningful love. But yes, that, that was where the, the Fortnite love started. I 100% agree. It's definitely changed the landscape of esports for sure in terms of inclusivity. So you love to see that. That's about all the time we have left for today, though. So thank you so much, Tech Girl, for speaking all things Fortnite. And I'll see you on the Battle Bus. Thank you so much. I'll see you there. I think he's out. Zero Maiden, dead. Nice, they wish. Kubix. Kurva, Kubix, this taki debil is bad. Yeah, Masu. And then I pull it up. Let's go, we out the game. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Yes! It's all YouTube, man. It's all YouTube. It's all YouTube. It's all YouTube. I gotta go. I, I see ya. I have to leave.
Let's move on from the great plays in Hot Drops to the great memes in Low Grounds. First up, Reddit user Mini Brick Productions created what I think might be a bazillion dollar idea. It's concept art for a Fortnite Lego set called Chaos at Caddy Corner. Can you hear that sound? Listen for it. It's the sound of Epic printing more money. Okay, it's, it's still the sound of, you know, kids having fun still and the potential possibly this does happen in the future for a lot more Lego sets, which would be really cool. I'm still also thinking about all the other product mashups and collaborations Epic could do because it sounds absolutely epic. <laughs> it certainly does. I mean, I would cop this set in a heartbeat. Absolutely a heartbeat or two. Next up though, Reddit user Vince Bruce 4 made a video to show the Fortnite reaction to when the item shop resets. What the hell is this? Some people are just never satisfied. I mean, is he that wrong though? Is the reaction really that far off? I mean, I look at the <laughs> item shop a lot and gotta be honest, a little disappointed, but I think it's because I own almost everything. Moving on, the dark fabled saber noticed something weird happens to Lexa during her hunter protocol emote. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, but I think you dropped your mouth. Uh, could you call that jaw dropping? Oh my gosh, Shio <laughs> now beating me with the puns. <laughs> hey, well, next up we have Skujo who recorded his five-year-old in a 2v1 at the end game. It got a little bit intense. All right, I like the fact that the five-year-olds are already competing inside Fortnite. But with that said too, I'm also hyped to see in 10 years how the kid looks in 2031's FNCS. I mean, maybe the chiller will still be in the game. I don't know. It was a very uh, cold, hard <laughs> oh. victory. <laughs> Finally, Baron Von Badger shows his teammates how to purr during the pause and claws emote. If you keep your finger on square while doing the kitty dance, it pays. We're in the river! I landed in the river! Oh, oh that was great. <laughs> I can't believe they fell for it. Amazing. <laughs> Honestly, there's always this fool me once type of situation in every single game or every single new item that comes out. I hope they don't get fooled again, though. I mean, time will tell. Honestly, still, though, a lot of good fun times in the low ground. We have to move on, though, to point of interest, where we take a look at the evolution of Tilted Towers. Fortnite's Chapter 1 map was home to some of the most iconic locations in the game. Years down the road, when Fortnite keeps making new maps and adding new locations, old ones such as Retail Row, Pleasant Park, and Tilted Towers will always be remembered as the special OG locations. Today, we'll be taking you through the story of Tilted Towers, the most popular yet somewhat controversial location on the map, and how it's evolved over time. Tilted Towers was first released in January 2018 during Season 2 of Chapter 1. It was released as a part of a mid-season update with other locations such as Shifty Shafts and Junk Junction. Tilted Towers was the first modern city in the game and was created at a time when there wasn't much going on on the map. The place was an instant hit because of its uniqueness, vertical gameplay, and the constant action it provided. When it was added to the game, everyone would land there. You would have over 50 people landing in that one city just for fun. At the time, large team modes weren't a thing, so people who didn't want long matches landed at Tilted repeatedly just for fun. Over the next few months, a lot of people started complaining about Tilted. It was so good and so many people landed there that there were barely 30 people left by the time the second circle had arrived. This caused the mid-game scenario to be a bit stale. 
Tilted Towers also played a big part in the storyline of seasons 3 and 4. Towards the end of season 3, a meteor appeared in the sky that seemed to be headed towards Tilted Towers. The meteor hit Dusty Depot instead of Tilted at the beginning of season 4, and Tilted was spared. However, during the rocket launch event of season 4, there was a moment when the rocket was trying to destroy Tilted Towers just when the visitor saved it using the power of the rift. Tilted survived for several seasons after that, and one of the most iconic things about the location became the battle of the two streamers, Nick Merckx and Aiden. Nick Merckx was always known for being the king of Tilted, since he was always landing there and made it out alive. Nobody loved Tilted as much as this guy. In one of Fortnite's later tournaments, the duo was seen fighting in Tilted over several matches, and then came that legendary match in which the two of them finally teamed up and dominated Tilted. Then came Season 8, and with it came a giant volcano. In the end of Season event, the volcano finally ended up destroying Tilted, and that was the last time we ever saw it. In Season 9, Tilted was rebuilt as a futuristic city called Neo-Tilted. It was way too different, and most players didn't like it as much as the original, although it did have some cool new features. In Season X, we saw it turn into Gotham City during the Batman crossover. Gotham City was hands down the most popular variant of Tilted, next to the original. The last time Tilted existed on that map was as Tilted Town, an old western town where building wasn't allowed. This was back in mid-2019, just before the Chapter 1 map was destroyed. Little did we know we wouldn't be seeing Tilted for another year. The first time we saw it on the new map is in December 2020, during the Season 5 update. This is Tilted's latest version, called Salty Towers. It's a mix between Tilted Towers and Salty Springs, and for some reason, is located in a desert biome. It's quite similar to the original Tilted, and it's great to finally see it after so long, but nothing really beats the vibe of that place. It almost felt like a map of its own, and we hope to see it return in its original form soon. As we've seen, Tilted Towers has gone through a ton of changes. Which iteration has been your favorite? Uh, for me, kind of a hot take, but I like Tilted Town a lot after a little while. It's just a very unique actual experience in the game. It was kind of tough to get used to, but then after the fact in competitive, you could plan your routes at guaranteed pumps and ARs. It was a cool twist to what, you know, regular Fortnite actually was. Not too bad. Probably my pick as well, but that about does it for us. But for more of our content, check out our YouTube and Twitter channels at WatchWOF. Thank you so much for watching. And as usual, virtual or in real life, here is your Victory Royale with cheese. And I got one cut. Imagine if I hit that. Oh, 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 oh,